folks, I'm Rex Hunt. Sunshine, we're out of lockdown in Melbourne. Magnificent. Some vitamin D, a 50 plus protection. It's magnificent. Trout fishing has been in my blood since 1963. The mighty Goulburn River is one of my favourite streams in all the world. And this is the place of the first screening of Rex Hunt's Fishing World on Channel 7, late on a Friday night in 1990. My goodness gracious me, I can't be that old. I tell you now though, trout fishing is magnificent, the Goulburn River, my dog Missy, it was all happening. And before we throw to the, uh, the segment folks, join me on the chat room, I'm there now. Uh, Bob, go. Got him. Oh, uh, not much of a fish. Oh, yeah, he's all right. A little brownie, look at that. Beautiful little fish. Nicely marked. Come here, mate. Wow, he really nailed that lure. Let's see if I can get the hooks out without hurting him. There we go. Just one more point there. All right, oh, little fella, off you go. I'll come back and see you next year. <sighs> Isn't this what it's all about, trout fishing? I absolutely love it. And it's got to be one of the most popular forms of fishing in Australia. But the funny thing about trout is they're not native to Australia. They were introduced here from the Northern Hemisphere during the last century, and they thrive throughout a large part of their new homeland. Trout, both browns and rainbows, are now found all the way from the New England district of far northern New South Wales, right down through the Great Divide, and well into Victoria, throughout most of Victoria, into parts of South Australia, and even in the southwestern corner of Western Australia. And of course, our island state, Tasmania, a real stronghold of trout, and one of the best trout fisheries in the world, in fact. You know, the other thing I really like about trout is the fact that you can target them with so many different forms of tackle and so many different techniques. You can fish with bait, you can cast and retrieve a lure, you can troll a lure, and of course you can fly fish. In this particular video, we're going to concentrate on bait fishing, lure casting, and a little bit of trolling. We're gonna leave things like down rigging and fly fishing and some of the more complex techniques until a later program. I reckon personally that bait fishing is probably the best way to get a good solid grounding in trout fishing. It teaches you so much about where trout live, what they eat, and how their diet changes from one season to another. Most important of all, it introduces you to the concept of matching the hatch. That's a term we take from fly fishing, but it's applicable to all styles of fishing. What it means is putting something in the water that the fish are familiar with and that they're expecting to find in that particular place at that particular time. Bait fishing teaches you about this because if you don't use the right bait in the right place at the right time, you don't catch fish. So sit back now, enjoy yourself, watch Rex hunt as he takes you to one of his favorite trout waters in Victoria and shows you just how important this concept of matching the hatch is in bait fishing. The mighty Goulburn River, spilling out of the Eildon Pondage over the Great Dividing Range here in Victoria. The Goulburn is home to many of Victoria's fanatical trout anglers. The Goulburn at the moment is in a winter type spring mode. It's coloured, it's dirty, but the fish are fresh from their spawning area and they're hungry. They can't take insects because there's none there. Grasshoppers after Christmas, along with the crickets and frogs. So we've got to use a natural bait. And that natural bait is not far away from here. Let's go and suss it out.
Ah, now we're starting to get into an area where we could expect a worm or two. And it's no good using grasshoppers in the Goulburn River at the moment because there's none there. You've got to use what the fish are likely to see. Look at this beautiful mint growing here. By gee, that's just absolutely beautiful native mint. If I catch a trout, I'll try some on top of the beautiful white flesh out of the Goulburn River. Now, this is what we're looking for. Logs and bracken and leaves and a build-up of soil. Now, when this little stream here has flooded, all of the alluvial soil and the silt has come down here and built up in this paddock. And that's where the worms are going to be. You've got to be where the worms are. Now, underneath this beautiful mountain soil, we should start to... Ah, come here. Come here. Ah, a little flat tail. And you come here too, mate. Come here. Gotcha. Now, what we've got here is a scrub worm, which is what we came here to get, and a flat tail worm. The flat tail will wriggle a lot more than the scrub worm, so we put two or three on the hook. And I'll show you that very, very soon. The scrubby is the staple diet of the trout in the Goulburn River, because it's a natural bait. When it rains, when the streams flood, they're swept into the system and the trout go after them. They don't go after flies in, in the early part of the season. They go after something substantial. So the basics of fishing are simple. Get the right bait, find the fish, and the fish will do the rest. Well, have a look at the size of that tree, miss. The locals reckon that's 150 years old. Tell you what, if I lived to be that old, there'd be a few fish in some of these rivers a little bit disappointed. But when you're fishing these types of rivers, it's just not pot luck. It's not just a matter of throwing in the worm and the fish committing suicide. You have to give some thought to where you're going to fish. And that's why it's important to choose the right spot. The Goulburn River, about eight kilometres downstream from the Eldon Pondage Spillway. And isn't the old girl angry today? They've had to let a lot of water go because of the enormous amount of rain we've had in the highlands. And if they don't let her go, she's going to fill up when the snow melts. So we've got to think like the fish. They're not going to be out in that raging torrent getting irritation through their gills with the silt and the twigs and weed that's being swept down at a mammoth rate. They're going to be in the perimeters and along these areas of the stream, looking for little bits of worm, of grubs, any type of food that may be washed in from the field after rain or swept down from the river. Missy, are you concentrating? Because you're my ticket to a fish here today, darling. Watch that rod. Thank you very much. There's a bite now. I'll just give him some time to take this scrubby. I threw the big worm in closer, hoping that there'd be a fish there. And here he goes now, and... Ah, yes, got you. Here he is. Come here. Oh, he's coming away from that snag. Now, he's not over big, but he was right... He's a little rainbow. Well, well, well. Come here. Get away from that little bit of weed there. He's a little rainbow, and... Yeah, look at that. Beautiful colours on him. He's just a little rip snorter. Now, here is a big lesson for you. This is a rainbow trout. Now, he's a little beauty. A female rainbow around about 400 grams, a scrub worm, unweighted, around the trees where he's taking shoulder. And he went up and he said, ho oh, ho, there's my lunch. In any type of bait fishing, one of the most important things you people have got to remember, give the fish something decent to take. Worms are a natural bait. Put three or four on the hook. So you have to wait a little bit longer, so what? It's a tasty morsel that the fish cannot refuse. Another bait that I've had great success on here at the Goulburn River is the humble saltwater mussel. It tastes foreign to the freshwater feeding fish, but it's an excellent bait for trout. Also, if you throw the shells into the river, it can act as a natural burley.
before. Might have just had a little, little bit of a nibble. Yes, good. Now, what we've got is a trout having a little bit of a look. Now, it's quite a big bait, and he might have just a little gob, so he's got to try and get his lips around it. I'm going to give him a little bit of line now. And I can just feel him moving away with the bait. Now, as he moves away, the idea is, is to click over the bale, to tighten up on the fish, and when you feel his weight, like I feel now, it would appear to be a little fish. However, beggars can't be choosers at this stage because in the Goulburn River, it can be a good one, a medium one, or a small one. Now, this trout here, he's taken the muscle, it's a rainbow, a pretty little fish, and that is typical of the trout in the Goulburn River. However, He's gone. Now what he's done, he's done me a favour because I was going to cut the line off at the mouth and allow him to swim away. He'd get rid of that in a week. But because the hook was in the lip, he's done us all a favour and we'll see him at this time next year. Come on, right on the edge of that weed bed there should be something. Hmm. Look at this. Isn't this a fantastic looking bit of water? And I just know that there's a big trout in there somewhere with my name on it. All I've got to do is find him. Bait fishing in streams like Rex has just shown us is a wonderful way to go fishing. It presents some problems because of all the snags and the flowing water. You can easily take your line in there and get it snagged up. But in another way, that's a bonus. Because of the moving water, the fish are concentrated in specific places. And by reading that water and applying the sort of lessons that Rex has shown us, we know where to find the fish. Now, what about in a big body of water like a dam or a lake where it's still and there's a heck of a lot of water between the fish? Well, the same basic principles apply. You still need to know where to look for the fish and how to present the bait in an appealing manner. Rex found that out recently when he visited one of the best trout fisheries on mainland Australia, Lake Eucumbean up in New South Wales. There was movement at the station for the word had passed around that the trout were moving at the frying pan arm. So Uncle Rex is on his way. The frying pan arm. Don't know where they got that name from. Perhaps the sizzling trout on the old campfire. Let's go and check out some of the best rainbow trout and brown trout waters on mainland Australia. Wagons, ho, left wheel. When you're fishing these impoundments high in the snowy mountains, they're subjected to an enormous amount of water in the spring. Firstly, from some of the seasonal rains. Secondly, from the enormous amount of snow that melts in the Alps. So you give them a good bait. Give the trout something to look at. Now, while the shallows is the place to fish, when the sun is high in the sky, the fish seem to go out deeper and work the perimeters and the valleys out in the middle of the lake. So with the use of waders, you can make your way out into the edge of the lake, making sure you don't get your tootsies wet, and you can get the maximum amount of distance with a bunch of worms and a heavier sinker, and then taking the rig back to the shore. It's a matter of clicking over the bale and popping the rod into the holder and waiting for some action. That was a touch. I'll just let it off and let him run with it. There's a big bunch of worms there, so I want him to get this down. Now, the line's going out at a reasonable rate, so I'll just give him a couple of metres and click the bale. Now, the next time I feel his weight, I'll strike. Now... Ah, yes. Now, I don't know what sort of class of fish we've got here. The noise you can hear is the drag of the reel. Now, the rod is a scientifically designed instrument for catching fish. 
It's a sort of a shock absorber. That's what angling is about. When the rod is fully loaded, that is, it reaches its maximum stress, the drag takes over. Hear the drag? That enables you not to get busted off when you're fishing with light monofilament fishing line. Now, I'm lifting now and then retrieving the line and going down. Now, this is not a humongous trout, but I think he's just a nice little yukon bean trout that doesn't want to come to me. Now, he's put on a fair show, this guy. Now, just like the surf, I'm not going to wind him up that far. I prefer to beach my trout on the gradual sloping banks here of this lake, rather than have the trout flapping round trying to get him in the net. Now, he's a little rainbow. And he's putting on a very nice show. So all I've got to do is get him to about there and then I walk him in. It's called beaching the fish. It is probably the safest way to land a fish. And by the time he gets to there, that is all. A Yukon bean rainbow of about 700 grams in beautiful condition. Look at, you, look at the rod. There's a touch on that rod up there. Yes. He's moving away with it. Now, that yellow tip, you can see it going. Now, he wouldn't even know I'm here. Ah, yes. Oh, gee. They fight well, these little rainbows. It's mid-morning, and gee, we had a quiet time getting fish here early. But with the sun on top of the reservoir, they're starting to move a little bit. Now, I just want him to get away. I'll have to go over the top of that column, sorry. You'll get a shot of him coming in here. Cole, if you get in here with me. Now, this is a brown trout. Now, he's a nice fish. He's about 800 grams. And didn't he love that bunch of worms? And that's the best way to do it. Just beach them. Gee, they're in lovely condition. So, a brown and a rainbow within two and a half minutes of each other. And I sat on my big rear for two hours thinking, what have I done wrong? And that's why we go fishing, isn't it? Because it's the glorious uncertainty that sends you back time and time again. Well, worms are a natural bait for many species in Australian waterways. And you still gotta look after them. One of the great uh, inventions over the last few years has been the polystyrene box. You know, the ones that the fishermen bring in, the snapper from New Zealand, or tomatoes or collies or whatever there is at the green grocer. I find they're perfect for keeping worms. And these guys here, the red flat tail worm, absolutely loving every little bit of the soil and peat moss that they can get. And that's the way to keep them. I find that it's just as easy to take the whole compartment away with me and then put the worms that I'm going to use for the day's fishing into a bucket. You'll find that they keep okay. You put the box back into the shade and you've got bait for tomorrow. So the little tip is, consider your worms. They don't like the dry and they don't like the heat, just like you. So look after your bait. With the rod there now. Look at that. Steve, look at, oh, he's on. Nice fish, too. Oh! I don't know, he could be a fish of reasonable size. 
Oh, did they fight well? Oh, this is great stuff. Hey? No phones, no faxes, no interruptions, and look at him go. Oh, go. Look at him. Now, mate. Oh, you're just going to be beautiful. Just absolutely lovely. Look at him glisten in the sunlight there. Now, mate, I want to introduce you to a couple of your friends over here, mate. Request permission to use runway 29er. Clear for landing. Here we go. The result of a couple of hours leisurely fishing on the banks of Lake Eucumbeen, on the grassy banks, using worms. What can be more natural than that? Now, those people who have been with Rex Hunt's Fishing World right from show one will know that I'm a stickler for looking after the fish. If you pay all the money in gear, petrol, bait, etc., you want to be able to take home a feed. Trout keep OK in cool conditions so you don't have to clean them straight away. But I believe that you must clean the fish in the water you caught them. Now, this rainbow has got quite a few scales. And as I take the scales off the side of the fish, it exposes the beautiful crimson band that is synonymous with the rainbow trout of the salmonid species. Let's get a few more of those off there. Turning it over and doing the other side. And they come off a lot easier when you keep the fish moist. If you can't keep it in the water, I find that just by wrapping it up in a wet towel keeps the scales nice. Now, we make the incision in the vent and go right up past the fins, right into the gill cage. Exposing the innards, look at that magnificent ready pink flesh. That means that this fish has been eating crustaceans. And there is my hook, right there. So he wasn't going to get away at all. Now we'll take a handful out, and this particular fish hasn't got a lot in it. I usually check the stomach contents and I find that if you just throw them as they are, the entrails, into the system like that, you'll find that the yabbies will clean it up and what doesn't clean it up, the trout will get the rest. So look after your fish. I'll just take the gills out of this fish just like that and there you have a lovely conditioned rainbow trout. Now there's one area that you really should be conscious about if you're cleaning fish. And this is the bloodline along the inside of the backbone. By simply going up or down with a knife and then running your thumbnail down, you'll see that you'll be able to take all of the bloodline away from the backbone Give that a bit of a wash there. And have a look at that. It's ready for a bit of foil, a few anchovies, a few prawns, a bit of seasoning, a bottle of white wine. Try the rainbow trout, but look after your fish. Ah, time for a lure change, I think. There's definitely fish out there. They just don't like what I'm throwing at them at the moment. Well, we've had a pretty good look at fishing for trout with natural baits. And as far as I'm concerned, that's about the best way to get started in the world of trout fishing. Fishing with natural baits teaches you a lot about where the trout live, what they like to eat, and how their dietary preferences change from one season to another as the year progresses. It really is a good way to learn about trout fishing. But a lot of us then want to go on to something maybe a little bit more challenging, a bit more active, a more hunting way of fishing. And I reckon that is fishing with artificial baits. Most of us call them lures. Lure fishing has just got something. I love it. I never get tired of lure fishing. I like my fly fishing too, but I come back to lure fishing all the time. To me, it's just got a special charm and an appeal. 
I've got to admit, I'm a bit of a lure collector too. I've got tackle boxes crammed full of lures, and on those cold winter's nights when it's no good to go fishing, I get them out and I sharpen the hooks and I play with them and I look at them and they, they remind me of fishing sessions I've had and fish I've caught and bigger ones that I've lost. Just fantastic, I really enjoy lure fishing. But I think it's a bit daunting for some people when they first get into fishing and they walk into a tackle shop and the walls are covered in hundreds, maybe thousands of different kinds of lures in a whole range of different colours. Every colour of the rainbow is up there and I'm sure some people look at it and think, there's no way that all those lures can catch fish. Surely I don't need all those different colours and styles. I reckon half of them are probably there to catch the fishermen rather than the fish. Well, it's not really true. Every one of those lures on that tackle shop wall will catch a fish under the right circumstances. And they're, they're different styles and different colours for good reasons, because there are days when one colour or one style works. And there are places where one style of lure works much, much better than, than any other style of lure. Look, if you're fishing in a little creek or a stream up somewhere high in the mountains, you might need a tiny little spinner like this one, little revolving blade spinner with a, a, a blade on it not much bigger than my little, little fingernail. Now, you throw that in a tiny little pool where the trout are 12, 13 inches long, it's going to work like a charm. Throw it in a big lake, it'll probably get lost. You know, at the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're trolling in a big body of water, a dam or a lake, you might need something like this Tassie Devil. It gets down, runs a metre or so under the surface, it's got a nice strong action and a flash and that'll pull the fish in. So those are, you know, two opposite extremes. In between there's a whole lot of other different variables too. And the more lures that you've got in your tackle box, the more capable you are of meeting the changing conditions that fishing throws up at you from day to day. Rex is going to show you what I mean right now when he fishes the Swampy Plains River in the highlands of New South Wales. Take a look at this. Just bring it down along that area there and there's nothing there. Well, when you're fishing a river, you've got to read the stream. And I can tell you now, it's pretty cool in here. This water's coming right from the top of Mount Kosciuszko off the snow. And I'm glad I've got these waders. Because being quite frank, it'd freeze the balls off Eddie Charton's billiard table. Now, I'm spinning. I'm using an artificial lure to attract a trout to strike. All of this beautiful flowing stream holds possibilities of catching a trout, both brown and rainbow. Now, the very keen and clumsy angler will come out and cast straight across the stream and he might get a fish. He might not as well. But what he'll do in the meantime is bypass some very fishable water. You don't want to sacrifice some beautiful water to get to the prime area first. So when the stream is going down, all of the action and disturbance goes down with it. The silt from walking on the boulders goes downstream. The trout become aware that everything's not right. So your first cast needs to be downstream and then systematically move two to three metres to your left hand or upstream side, meticulously working every stretch of water. Never disregard any piece of water that may hold a fish. I think I've heard that somewhere before. Oh, he bumped it then. Ah, oh, he can't be too big, but the change of lure. You see, this is what I'm saying. This little guy, a little brown, had a go at the gold tylo twice. So I changed to silver with a bit of blue on it, and he took it. Now, this little guy is, come here, mate, a little brown trout. Now, if you stop wriggling, I'm going to send you back, all right? I wet my hand. Now, please stop wriggling. I want to really let you go. Right, thank you very much. There's only one hook through you, so I'll just get it out, and I'm going to let you go. Down in the mainstream, and off you go. Now, 
The most important thing in spinning is it is not just throwing a piece of metal into a stream and the fish committing suicide. It's an art. And I know if you're a fly fisherman, you might say, ah, a little bit of fantasy land. But spinning is an art. Twice that fish had a go at the gold tylo. I tried a gold uh, Abu Vibrax, similar to a Selda, and I finally put on the silver tylo with the blue flash, and he took it. So when you're spinning, think. Think like a fish. The fish goes up, oh no, I'm not gonna take that, might be danger. Suddenly something dif different comes along, bang. Thank you very much. Now, if you want to place your lure right where the fish are, it's most important to have the right setup. And the fish are going to be near structures. I've spoken many times in the series about structures. Fish need them for cover and for feed. And trout are no different. And underneath this glossy surface, there's structures. There's weed. There's small pebbles. There's boulders. There's probably pieces of timber and trunks of trees. This is where the feed and the cover is going to be. And this is where the trout are going to be lurking. So we allow about a metre from the rod tip down to the lure, because then we have the perfect pendulum to be able to launch the metal lure out across the stream. Let's see if we can put it where I want it. Oh, just where I wanted it. It's most important for me to get that slack up because if you've got slack, you've got a bow in the line and if the fish takes it, you won't have any tension to set the hook. It's a little bit like using very light line in marlin fishing. Now you may notice that I'm very meticulous in working the tip of the rod. Now if you're just going to retrieve a shiny piece of metal back across the river, there's nothing for a sleepy old trout to say, oh, I'll have a look at this. What you've got to do is you have to put an action on it. And you can do this many ways. Number one, by lifting the rod up and down to make the lure go up and down. Number two, with your retrieve, to quicken it, stop. Quicken it, stop. And then consistent. By doing all these things, you can put an action on the lure that might just talk a trout into taking it. Oh, see him come out of the water, the little bloke. Oh, gee, the river's full of them. Absolutely full of them. The size of him. Now, another little brown. Now, I want to show you this brown before I let him go because he's fine. Brown trout doesn't have any spots on the tail as against the rainbow. The brown has spots on the upper part of his body and you may be, this guy's silvery because of the cold water, maybe see the little red spots there. Now you can see where he's hooked. He's quite placid. It's a matter of taking the hook out and allowing the fish to gain his composure and he's gone, it's as simple as that. The swampy plains is full of juvenile trout at the moment. Those have been liberated by the New South Wales fisheries, which have their main headquarters at the Gaydon Trout Farm on the banks of the Threadbow River, which feeds Jindabyne. But this is one of New South Wales' magnificent mountain streams. And spinning can be a lot of fun, because while you're catching juvenile trout, you never know when the big one's going to come along. that current. What have we got? A brown or a rainbow? Little brownie. Come here mate. I'm gonna let you go. Oh, just beautifully hooked in the tip of the jaw there. Isn't that a lovely little fish? Look, that's only a small trout, especially in a big body of water like this. But in the right place and with the right tackle, 
Little fish like this can be just as much fun to catch as the big ones. There are great little streams all over Australia for trout fishing, and if you scale down your gear and fish ultralight, you can turn small fish into a lot of fun. Have a look at this. Well, the Otway region of Western Victoria is littered with many, many streams that at their mouth at Bass Strait look nothing more than just a dribble flowing into the ocean. But above the Great Ocean Road, we have magnificent streams like this. Now, the Otways hasn't received a liberation of Victorian bred trout since the late 1960s. For one reason, these streams offer the perfect haven for trout to feed, to live and to breed. And therefore, they are self-supporting. And to catch these trout, which are minute, when you come to think of the Yugambeen trout and the Tasmanian trout, you need specialist gear. And when you use specialist light casting gear, fishing streams like this is a whole new frontier. Far too many of us, when we fish these crystal mountain streams, approach them just like a basic piece of water like the bay or the goldman or a lake where it doesn't matter if you make a noise or you're seen by the trout. But in these streams, they are aware of any foreign object and at the moment, I'm one of them, and although I'm being born in Australia. The fact of the matter is that the trout face upstream for two reasons. The oxygen goes through their gills, and that's why a trout in a lake has always got to swim, because he's got to get oxygen through the gills. And the other is, he's on the lookout for any pieces of food that may come from upstream. So approach your water, look at it, read your stream, work out where the fish is going to be, and hopefully, well, we might have some success. Can't believe that. And probably neither can you people watching. If you're working a stream like that with a fallen log and boulders, in a stream you know carries a lot of fish and you don't get knocked off on a number one salter, they're not on the job. And it's time to move on to the next part of this glorious little stream. And one of the tremendous advantages in trout fishing is the old humble blackberry. Have a look at those rip snorters there. Absolutely magnificent. And that's part of the reason I come to these beautiful areas, particularly at this time of the year approaching Easter. These are absolutely just sensational. And one thing concerns me, and I'm being quite serious here, it's our litter problems in Australia. If we don't stop littering everywhere we go, we're going to use up all of our rights. We're not going to be able to mushroom, trap a rabbit or eat a blackberry. And wouldn't that be a shame? bring that lure down underneath that little bit of a tree there. Now, right up at the head of this pool, that log could have been there longer than I've been on this planet. And that's too long to remember. What we have here is the wind in the autumn can be very, very strong, strong enough to push trees like this over. But that's not all that bad. It's sad that the tree had to go but this has created an enormous part of the environment for the trout. Because when I'm long gone, these are going to be the areas that you young people are going to bring your sons and daughters and point out that this is a good place to fish. Trout need two things. They need cover and they need feed. And when they've got both of those, our trout fishery will get back to something like it should be and not in its disgraceful state at the moment. reckon it'd go off there. Well, when the lure is continually rejected by the trout and they're not interested, it's time for a change of lures because quite often in lure fishing, a change of lures put past the same area that you're casting monotonously with one lure, that new lure, well, that 
sometimes does the job. Now, lures ain't lures. Big lures are meant for streams that you can cast a long way across, like the swampy plains that you saw earlier in the season, or the Goulburn, or on the Great Lake down there with Jimmy Allen at Tasmania. But the bladed type lures are the ones that have that revolving blade going round and round and round, causing plenty of vibration. The rooster tail lure is a rip snorter from America. It creates a bubble trail out of the back, and with this particular blade going round and round, it does two things. The vibration and the water displacement cause some sort of area where the trout says, mm hmm, what's there? It also enables you to fish the stream properly because if you've popped a silver wobbler up into that run, you might get six inches of fishing area. When you pop a rooster tail or a salter or any other bladed lure, at least you get 15 or 20 seconds of lure working available water. So select the lures for the waters. Big lures for big waters, and small lures for small streams. And can you believe that about four inches of water, this rainbow, a beautifully, beautifully looking rainbow. Have a look at that. Now, if there's any prettier sight than a rainbow trout from a mountain stream, well, I want to know about it. Now, I'm certainly not going to hurt you, my friend. I'm going to endeavour to get those hooks out of you, just like that. The rainbow, remember what I told you at the Goulburn? If he hasn't got that glorious red patch that he's got down his side, that band, the tail has spots on it. That rainbow, he's going back, this little male fish, into the mountain stream, and away he goes. Perseverance is the name of the game. A fair income, I feel like a pack horse. I've taken off about 10 kilos, which is good. I've climbed waterfalls. I've been chased by black snakes. I've come up here and put a beautiful little rooster tail over the top of an area where I thought there may be a fish and I've snagged him. But the real lesson is in fishing. The environment, it's all magnificent. And whether you're on the shelf with a 200 kilogram black marlin or in the Otway streams with a little brown or a little rainbow, fishing is the same. A balanced outfit, a beautiful little Shimano rod and reel from the Complete Angler, I just thought it might have been a bit of a toy. But to me, fishing these small areas, it's absolutely perfect. And with a little spinner and a little bit of luck on your side, plenty of perseverance, you can always come out on top. walking along this nice high bank just polaroiding the edges of the weed beds and I just saw a lovely little brown trout about maybe half a kilo just cruising along the edge there put the lure past him and as it came past his nose he turned to follow it but then he balked and took off I think he might have seen me that's one of the disadvantages of being on a higher bank like this you can get silhouetted against the skyline I think he might have seen me that bloke but look the nice thing about fishing a river is I'll probably go around this next corner take my time, keep working these weed beds, and I reckon I'll find another fish. You know, you can work a river like this from the bank. I can cover most of the water. I can walk a couple of kilometres in a day, and it's just different water all the time. It's a wonderful way to fish. Lakes are a little bit different, of course. If you're stuck on the bank on a lake, there's a lot of water out there in the middle that can have fish in it that you just haven't got access to. Rex found that out recently when he visited one of our best trout fisheries in the central highlands of Tasmania. He fished with John Fox at Lake Sorrel, which is a really terrific trout fishery. Just have a look at some of the big brownies that Rex and John came across trolling and spinning out in the boat. OK, Rex, uh, we've come up onto this uh, bit of a plateau now here on the lake. Might be a good time to start letting that Tassie Devil out. OK, mate. Well, we're trolling. And as in spinning, it's an art. It's just not a matter of throwing a piece of metal with a treble hook in the end and a trout grabbing it and commit suicide. John, why did you select this area that you call the plateau? Well, there are a series of uh, shaley banks in this lake. And uh, where you get that up, uplifting, there's a lot more life there. 
a lot of crustaceans and snails, etc. Also, when we're trolling like this, our lures are down about four feet at this speed. Yep. We're trolling in about five feet, so they're about a foot off the bottom. So if we're f uh, fishing, spinning or trolling in 60 foot of water with a paravane we can get down, or with a free swimming lure we can get up, but there's a lot of water in between here, not much room for error. Absolutely, absolutely. You want ev everything on your side when you're trout fishing. Well, I've got a Tassie Devil on, it's got those transparent wings and a beautiful coloured body, and she's gliding. And the end of my rod, which is pulsating down there, suggests to me that that lure is working at its very, very best. It's gliding, it's just starting to sail through the water, and if a fish happens to see it, well, he's in all sorts of trouble. Now, our people at home, John, are probably saying, gee, that water looks discoloured for spinning because Rex always maintains that you need clear water for spinning, but that's not quite so at Lake Sorrel. No, here at Lake Sorrel, the water's always a little turbid. Yeah. Uh, I think the conditions today are, uh, are quite ideal, actually. Uh, if we drag it past one's nose, I'm sure he'll let us know he's there. Well, I've got the drag set. Once again, let's go through these particular important areas. The drag is set because with this five and a half pound line, if I get knocked off and I've got no stretch in the line, bang, it'll break just like cotton. But with the drag set and with a nice whippy rod, this one is a Rex Hunt signature spinning rod for trout, well, it's going to act as a beautiful bungee type of an effect if the trout does grab the end of it. So that lure, pulsating like you wouldn't believe, and now, as in all sorts of fishing folks, we sit back and we wait. Yeah, mate, yeah, on what, that you inside rod. Oh. That little super yeah. duper I put just behind in the wash. They're not worried about coming up the uh, the wash there. Mate, can you oh, wind I'll, that I'll, in for yeah, me? I'll get this one out of your way, Rex. You know, I just changed the lure. We'd been bumped a couple of times, and by bumped I mean the fish appear to come up and nose the lure like a big barramundi does. These big brown trout here at Lake Sorrel. And a super duper lure made by Wonder, Johnny Ooh. Novak... Uh, I'll just get that over the top there, mate. There you are. Right. Johnny you. Novak, an American Australian, came across here in the 1950s and produced these lures. And probably one of my first fish ever on a super duper in the Goulburn River and the pondage was really what hooked me on spinning. And fishing with Bob, look at the size of this fish here. Like, this is just beautiful. Oh, look at that. And have a look at him. He wanted that lure. Now, I wonder why the others were just nudging it. Ooh. Like, he's a nice brownie, isn't he? My word, he is. And look at him, he's not real happy. Yeah, I'll just see if I can stop him thrashing and guide him to your net, mate. Because he's a nice brownie. My word. He's not done yet. So that rod will just tire him out. I'll try not to let him go down because of the amount of weed here. I'll just try and keep his head out of the water and just guide him into your net there, ah, mate. Ah, lovely male fish. Now, isn't fish. he a lovely male fish? My word. Wow. And, and I'll just show the people there if I can get him just to... Uh, just stop it with you for a moment. I'm going to look after you. Well, we might look after him right here, Johnny, and just show the people that yeah. we're going to eat that fish, and this is the way to put them out of their misery. So if you want to grab your little priest, yeah. we'll show these people how to do that. But look at that hook jaw. Yeah, big male. And I'll just get that out of there. By gee, he really wanted that, and it's just a change of lure. I think this is a lesson for our people watching, Foxy, is that if you're getting knocked off with proven lures like Tassie Devils, that something just a little bit out of the ordinary... I'll just get that out of there like that. Oh, and have a look at that locked jaw. Now, just show us how to put him out of their misery, mate, because we're going to eat this guy. He's going back on our flight. Nice trout. Yeah, absolutely. Just sort of line him up, and one little... Oh, whoops. Really didn't do that quite right. It needs to be right across the top of the eyes. And good night. And there he is. Yeah. What an absolute beautiful brand. An estimation of weight there, mate. Oh, let's not estimate. You get your little pair of scales out there. And to me... Well, that's what trout fishing is all about. That's why we go. An absolute ripper of a brown trout. Male, naturally bred here at Lake Sorrel. Going on the lie detector now by you, Foxy. He's going to be four pounds, Rex. Do you think he is? He's going to be four. Well, to say that he's going Ooh, to be four... I'm a real fisherman, you see. I bent the truth a little bit. He's just over three and a half, three and three quarters, perhaps. Well, isn't that just absolutely lovely? A marvellous brown trout on a spinner. And spinning, well, you never know. Trolling is that good because you cover so much ground. But spinning and trolling, give it a go. 
fly fishing and bait, okay as well. I think it's trout fishing that is the real goer, isn't it? You betcha. Hey, Foxy. You haven't done it again. <laughs> I don't believe it. I tell you what, this. it's a recipe for the right thing, mate, is stop for a cuppa after an hour of trolling just with a couple of bumps and put a little Rexy Hunt special out that I'm looking at, a little revolving blade lure, and this little Shimano outfit, mate, is just giving this trout a heck of a time. I reckon he's a nice fish. I haven't had a look at him yet, but I've got only two kilo line on, so I'm going to take it easy and just see if I can bring him up. We're in reasonably shallow water here. Uh, oh, have a look at this. Oh, oh yes. If you don't mind, umpire. The top fish. Isn't that a top trout? We're certainly in the four-pound department there, all better. Do you think? Oh, yeah. Mate, I don't know whether he realises that he's on yet or not, but he's pretty placid. He might go absolute ape here in a minute. Well, we won't he's take a chance. He's not going to take a chance. <laughs> now, have a look at that lure that I'm using. Now, that bit of red just sticks out like the proverbial, doesn't oh, it? Oh, my word. And, and perhaps you see, you've seen there, folks, the advantage of netting a fish because the, the lure has come right out of the trout's gob. And Foxy, I'll get you to do the old last rites on him. He's a lovely fish. Well, there's no risk about the four pound here. We're going to go way over. You reckon we might? I'll just give him a gentle tap. OK. Good night. Whoops. Just in another one. And that's the end of that. That's him. Mate, can you get the old lie detector? Because I just want to show my family and then the hundreds of thousands of other people what looking. A what a fish. Just what male brown trout fishing is all about in Tasmania. A little bit of a red lure on the end of it. I'll just bring it in there and show you. That's called a keel. That prevents the line from twisting. But that revolving blade lure with the red body, absolutely magnificent. Now put her on the lie detector, son. She's certainly working. OK. Whoops. Just... Put her on the lie detector because if this is not four pound, mate, I'll go and get a hair transplant. <laughs> Oh, you've got no fears. So Lord Ted, no worries, I won't be there. Four and a half. Four and a half pounds. Four and a half. The most magnificent freshwater fish you could hope for. A little Rex Hunt prototype. Well, we might see him in the stores pretty soon because this one down here has been dynamite. Absolute dynamite. This fish has gone right under the He's boat. He's gone under the boat. Is he what, mate? I tell you what, we've got to be very, very careful here. I've got to let him do what he wants to do. And when I can retrieve a bit of line, I even put the tip down in the water. And using that tip as a little bit of a lever, I might just leave this drag off a little bit. You'll see clearly the, the drag starting to just go out. Now, that fish, he shouldn't get off and he shouldn't break. If I take my time, here he is here. Look, he's tangled oh. himself up. Yeah. Oh. And now he wants to go. So I've got to have the drag off on this occasion. And this is for you young people at home. I want to explain the drag. See that? The drag is working against the fish. If I'd have had the drag done up solid with a two kilo line, bang, he would break the line. The fish would have got away. So now I've really got to start and concentrate and use the end of the tip of that rod. That is my shock absorber. And because he's under the boat, I don't want the line to cut, touch the keel. So I'm giving every chance to that line to retrieve this fish. And this is an unorthodox way I know, folks. But we need this lovely trout to show you people at home just why it's a shame that I have to leave my beautiful hometown, Victoria, and come down here overseas to Tasmania. Now, this fish will come up now. I'm sure of it. He's just about ready to come and see me. Have a look at him, isn't he? Just absolutely beautiful. Oh, he's a beauty, Rex. He's a beauty. And That's you know what, what he, you know what he loved? And he's yours. He loved that little prototype I'm testing out. Oh, that little revolving fish. blade lure. Now have a look at it, Foxy. Gee. The red with the silver. And I reckon that's just flared his gills up and he said, that's mine. Well, look at that. But I... what he didn't know, mate, was that treble was right in the end of that lure. Now what a superb fish. Just absolutely lovely, isn't it? So the lesson, Foxy, for all of our viewers, isn't it, is that... Set your drag. Yeah, set your drag. Must set your drag, otherwise they'll break your line every time, these fish. Most time, the angler breaks the line, doesn't he? The fish doesn't. 
No, that's right. That's right. I'm absolutely delighted too in the performance of that little lure. Isn't he a beauty? I'll tell you what. But I'm looking at a range of lures so you people can go out and use them and catch plenty of fish like I'm down here today with Foxy. Well, have a look at that. Tina Turner's earring. <laughs> and I'm just having a look at it. And that really turned that brown trout on. You know, so spin fishing, it really is good fun. It's not just throwing out a bit of metal and the fish committing suicide, it's an art. And like any art, if you take your time and persevere, you'll eventually come out on top. Well, this is what trout fishing is all about, I reckon. Tasmania. Oh, they put on a little bit of chilly weather for us, Foxy, but... Oh, this time of the year. Well, we're all rugged up and it's fine, isn't it? But as I said, this is what trout fishing is about. It's getting out in this pristine country and it's absolutely marvellous down almost this wilderness, isn't it? Oh, beautiful here. But you yep. don't have to get a boatload of fish, John. No. Like, to me, five magnificent fish in an hour spinning on the rock bar. Well, aren't they magnificent fish? Now, the browns, they all seem to look alike, but th that one there is more brown than the other. What, what determines what colour and, and what sort of figura configuration they take on? Well, in my observation, these goldy-looking fish seem to be the ones living more in the marshes, and we seem to catch the more silvery-looking chaps. We seem to catch those more out in the open water. Yeah. But uh, they take on that colouring, or that coloration, if you like, when they get back up into those marshes, into that shallow water. What are they likely to be feeding on? Well, we'll, ha we'll uh, pop them open and have a look, but uh, I'll be surprised if we don't find stick caddis, uh, there'll be snails, and hopefully, hopefully a, a few galaxias. Well, a lot of people love to eat trout, a little bit of foil, a few champignons, a bit of lemon juice and wine, and bake it in the oven. Others prefer to fill it. But my idea of maintaining fish in the right condition, John, is to gut them as soon as possible. We're just in from the water, so show us how it's done. Absolutely. Take this chap here. I, I like a bit of water when I'm gutting fish. It seems to keep everything nice and clean as you go. So I always start from the vent, slip up, come behind the last gill and through it, and then in front of them all, and all that gill Gill rakes, they all come out in one hit. Then we open him up. It's a bit gory, probably, for your viewers, Rex, but. Ah, oh, they're all fishing people, mate. They understand that uh, man loves to eat fish, and there's nothing wrong with taking a fish to eat, is there? Oh, my like, word. We release a lot of fish on this show, but I see here that you weren't so quick to say, I'll oh, put him back to fight another day because you say there's millions of fish in Tasmania. Well, there's certainly excellent stocks in this lake. Now, look at the colour of that fish. Magnificent. And really, uh, some of our lakes, let's say Arthur's Lake in particular, uh, you're really doing the fishery a favour yep. if you take a few out because yep. uh, there are actually, I know it might sound peculiar to some people, but some of our lakes actually have too many fish in. Yeah. Not, not all of our lakes. Just some, but this... I notice your government are very, very heavy into tourism and they realise the value of the dollars coming into Tassie and the licence I bought does me for three days. You can get one for three days to three years and isn't that marvellous that I can come down here for three days and casually fish your waters? Yes, for $12 you can have three days fishing and you can fish round the clock if you want. Well, mate, I've had $12 fishing this afternoon <laughs> with you. Now, for our people at home, budding fly fishing people, particularly young novice people, John's going to show us just what... A a trout can have in its stomach contents. Now this fellow, as I said, I'd be surprised if he didn't have a lot of snails. And look at this, He's, it's almost all snails. Now there's a shrimp there, one of our prehistoric Tasmanian shrimps. Um, I hope our cameraman can see him. No drama about that. That uh, is a funny looking, almost a water flea type of thing, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I think it's called uh, an anaspides. I think I had that in the army and a bit of penicillin <laughs> got rid of it, mate. Yeah, just joking, folks, just joking. <laughs> and have a look at that snail, still alive there, amazing. Yes, yeah. So what you've got to do is look after your fish. And our man John Fox from Top Line Trout Tours, well, he's a top line fella, but he's a top line guide as well. And I'll be going back to the mainland for, with some beautiful trout. But just remember those things. You can come here from three days to three years and fish in marvellous waters. Have a look at the stomach contents so you can match the hatch if you're a fly angler. And above all, when you go fishing, you can take home some beautiful trout to eat. How about that, folks? 30 years ago? A long time ago.
but great memories. I still go up to Goulburn and have fantastic sessions on the trout, particularly above Alexandra. And also Lake Eugenbean, magnificent. The frying pan arm, the rising water over the new sprung spring grass, the trout going bang on the worms, magnificent. Talking about magnificent, we're going now to Thailand to exotic fishing with Mike Bailey. He's gonna show us just what catching arapaima is all about. You wanna have a look at a magnificent creature? Just have a look at this, folks. On camera, John Pierce, doing okay. Pierce on or Pierce off, he's a good bloke. I think you'd better just uh, go to the segment, Bob. Hey, there's Mike from Exotic Fishing Thailand. So uh, this morning, we're gonna catch arapaima on the fly and we're gonna to try to do it from the paddle boat. We did a paddle boat video before that was very comical. Um, some people liked it, but we only caught a red tail catfish. So now we've started off in the morning. Uh, we've got better light and hopefully the video will. Harold Palmer saying hello already. So, so just thought I'd fill you guys in some of the flies that we use. Anything that's like a tilapia or a small fish pattern like a java barb. I mean, there's a, all with a decent sized tarpon hooks. Our fly rods are tarpon set up 12 weight. Anything like that. Nice uh, bait fish pattern, tilapia pattern. We may even go to the floating pellets. Uh, this mouse fly seems to work well. And then we've got a pellet fly. But I'm going to start out with my own favorite, the, uh, I keep calling it the puppy fly because it looks like, I don't know why, it's got these black stripes and stuff on it. Maybe Dalmatian pattern, I don't know what it is. But this is a fly I like to use here. So that's hopefully the one. It's very slow sinking because it's got a lot of, uh, a lot of bulk to it. So it gives the fish a lot of time to target it and they'll still hit right when they come up close. So uh, Arapama action, Arapama fly fishing from the paddle boat. Uh, the winds dropped for now. It was blowing a gale a few minutes ago. So we're gonna get out there and uh, try to catch some fish. Okay, I'm all set. Got my fly rod, got my bottle of water. I'm gonna head out and start this, uh, what do we call it? Arapama paddle boat fishing. Let's go. Let's hope I don't fall out of my heels into the lake, but we'll give it a try. Let's see. Whoa. Ouch. Definitely not as flexible as I used to be. Okay. All set. Watch out, Arapama. Here I come. Okay, so I've made a few casts in the corner, and then what we've done is brought the boat out. I got back in the boat, and I'm trying to drift in to this corner. I think this is where we're gonna get some fish in here, so. Yes, yes, I got him. Ah, you come off. Oh my God. <laughs> I turned to talk to you guys. The fly sunk down, Arapaba hit the fly in the drop. Oh my God, okay. I don't know if he felt it or not, we're gonna. We're gonna keep going. Oh, unbelievable. I <laughs> oh, what a crazy day. Okay, we gotta land one. We gotta land one soon. Well, mission accomplished. Uh, Arapama on the fly from the paddle boat, uh, all by a fat guy with a puppy fly and a 12 weight rod. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I think we're gonna, uh, let's show them the fish, guys. Take a look at the fish, and then we're going to give it another uh, another half an hour, see if we can catch another one. Just a small one, but a beautiful fish. Obviously, these uh, these new fish hadn't seen this yet, so uh, we took them by surprise. All right, perfect. How about that, folks? Thailand. What about the backdrop, apart from the fish, the arapaima? Magnificent work, Michael. I knew too, Johnny Pierce. Now, the clip that's going to take us out is serious. It's about MS. I'll tell you what MS is, because that will get your attention. And I can tell you now, if you buy a raffle ticket and win, I'll personally present the prize to you. See you next time, folks, in the wonderful world of fishing. I'm Rex Hunt, and you're not. G'day, folks. I'm Rex Hunt. Now, Multiple Sclerosis Limited is a charity partner of Go Fish Nagambi. MS is a chronic 
debilitating disease that attacks the central nervous system. It's horrible and it's most common in young adults. The frightening thing about it is there ain't no cure. MS and Go Fish Nagambi have put together this magnificent raffle with the major prize package valued at over 21,000 large folks. How good is that? The boat, generously donated by Stasa, is the 4.3 metre 409 Proline Angler with a 40 horsepower Mercury on it. And to get into your favourite ramp, it all sits on this matched aluminium trailer. Now the Stasa 409 features front and rear casting platforms, bow mount thruster plate and custom wrap. Also included is 12 months insurance thanks to our friends at Nautilus Marine. So folks, what are you waiting for? Come down to Melbourne Marine Centre and check out this magnificent prize. All proceeds support Aussies living with MS. Righto, follow this link, yibbity yibbity, get your tickets now.